So the first artist tonight talking is one of uh, our newest Hatch artists, but she's very well known locally, so I'm sure you've heard of her. Um, and she's going to be talking about her work, um, Dust of Stars, alongside the rest of her practice. So I have the pleasure of introducing Fiona Campbell. Thank you very much. <laughs> Here, or I, can't really I hope you've had a chance to have a look at the, um, the work, and I know some of you have come in just now, so have, do have a look at, um, at the walkout. So, um, Dust of Stars uh, was created as a site uh, responsive installation, and I say site responsive rather than site specific because I um, may, you know, recreate it in another space. Um, but it's made of recycled, found and discarded materials, um, mainly from my own collection, um, which goes back a long, long time. Um, and some of it comes from stuff that was in the barn that Ian kindly loaned me. So it includes things ranging from metals to rope to wood to insect, um, twine, wire, and everything in between. So um, do go and have a look at it if you haven't. So I'll be talking about my um, the work, Dust of Stars, um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about my other work. So what you can see here is just some sketches from my sketchbook, which is often how I start, um, by working up ideas. Um, and it took me quite a long time to sort of get going for the, for, for the ideas for this. Um, just to give you a bit of a backdrop about my work, I'm interested in line. Um, I gravitate towards the linear. So my um, focus is how um, line is a way of um, describing complex web of relationships from micro to macro. And to me, line, and when I say line, I'm talking about things like neurons, um, tentacles, branches, blood vessels, mycelium, roots, and even dark matter that's almost invisible. Well, it is invisible to us um, in, in the uh, outer space. Um, and, and I see that uh, line, those lines, um, as denoting energy, um, which is an ongoing process. So rhizomic connections, all of those connections, um, are metaphors for life and the tra tra trajectory of growth. Uh, so I see line as a doing thing, an active, uh, an active force um, throughout nature. And um, all matter is in a process of becoming and everything is connected. And that kind of is where I started um, with Dust of Star. Um, there's a, a writer called Tim Ingold who wrote a book called Life of Lines. And he explains the world in terms of line um, being its foundation. So my reappropriation of reclaimed, found and discarded materials relates to waste and um, our relationship with matter, nature and ourselves. Theodore Roosevelt said, do what you can with what you have where you are. And I'm a gatherer scavenger. Um, I enjoy transforming scrap and I love giving abandoned objects new life. And I've been doing that for decades actually. Um, but more recently, my work has focused much more on environmental concerns. Um, so um, waste being a, a kind of big part of that. Um, but, you know, anti-consumerist sort of um, issues um, and, you know, just generally how humans um, impose themselves on, on nature. Um, and I like to juxtapose materials. So I think even in, in the piece here, um, there's a contrast of sort of fragile, but also um, strong, hard and soft, that sort of thing. I think there's a kind of dynamism that comes from that. And um, process of materiality are key in my work. So um, to me, the medium is the message. What, what I actually use is part of, of you know, um, is part of what I'm trying to say with that. Um, so it's kind of quite artivisty in a way. So that means that I'm being quite activist in my approach, um, kind of combining 
you know, art with activism. And most of the time I'm thinking about um, how we, we perhaps need to just reduce, make do, and it's about care and repair. And a lot of the way that I work, um, which is labor intensive, is quite meditative. So I enjoy that process of um, slow art. And to me, it's a sort of form of healing, a kind of suturing. And I also love creating art in abandoned, distant places, which is where um, Hatch comes in. I, I, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to create work in an interesting space. Um, I wasn't sure about death and microwaves as a theme to start with. Um, it was uh, I struggled with my ideas. Um, this is a collage of mine that I was I, I made to sort of kind of try and kind of get myself going. Um, I did visit an exhibition by Anselm Kiefer at the White Cube in London um, called Finnegan's Wake, and um, that kind of gave me a bit of a, um, a, a bit of inspiration. His work is um, very much about, well, he uses, he, he's very audacious in his scale for a start, um, and this particular exhibition, um, he filled rooms and vitrines um, and corridors um, with huge concrete ruins and rubble um, and um, his, he calls his, this is what he calls his arsenal, um, which he collected over decades. He doesn't see it as an end, he sees it as a beginning. So all these discarded materials he sees as a, as a sort of start of something new and that's kind of how I approach mine as well. Um, and he speaks of the detritus as an incessant metabolism, the beginning of a rebirth, which I really, I really like that. Um, that description um, and the creative cycle is a ceaseless shuttling back and forth between nothing and something, a constant going from one state to the other, um, which I kind of think is also perhaps a sort of good description of life and death, the fact that there's this cyclical persistence and one merges into the other and there is really no defining moment between one and the next. So anyway, his show uh, kind of gave me a bit of an idea about using my own hordes of scrap in my garden. So, um, I do have this um, propensity, propensity to hoard, um, and um, so I've been collecting things for quite a long time, um, and in my garden there is a corner where I have this scrapyard, I suppose you could call it, um, and it had become a bit of a worry to me because I have got a space issue as well. So one of the thoughts I had for this uh, piece, um, Dust of Stars, was that I would create a scrap pile, um, think about play, play, shadow play, um, but also at the same time uh, use some of these, these things that were lurking um, as a way of taking them to, to another place and then maybe after they've had their time here, um, they may end up being taken to the dump, <laughs> the, the recycling center rather. Um, but I, I have a feeling that that might, um, that might not happen. I'll see. I mean, I think I probably will have to be quite, quite strict with myself and, and do that. But um, some of them may wait, find themselves back in my garden. <laughs> um, so, Dust of Stars also questions, um, it questions waste, um, but it questions what is dead and what is of value, because I think we throw away so much. Um, and. So also in this, in this work, I'm trying to look at the bigger picture um, and kind of ask existential questions. Um, you know, the universe is just so massive. Uh, I'm in awe of the magnitude of it, and I'm sure you are too. And we're told that all of life is made from the dust of stars from billions of years ago. Um, interstellar dust, interstellar dust, um, from a cloud of gas, a supernova. So um, the fact that we return to dust is also kind of a nice idea, the fact that there is this cycle. Um, there, is, there is death, of course, how, how we understand that, but there is also this continuum, this transformation that, that is ongoing, ongoing and ongoing. Um, Carl Sagan, an astronomer, wrote, uh, or said rather, the cosmos is within us, we are made of star stuff. So, yeah, we're insignificant, really, in the scheme of things. Um, 
And yeah, it's just something to, to think about really. The, the fact that, um, well, I kind of question what is, what is living, what is dead, um, as this matter is ongoing, is this stuff alive? I normally spend ages on making work. Um, and as I said, my work is quite labor intensive, but I felt what I wanted to do for this was to um, minimize that time. I did spend five days on creating it, but that's not um, anywhere near the time that I often spend on my work. And so uh, I wanted to be playful. Um, so I, in a way, I kind of approached it as though I was just taking a line for a walk and um, trying to use stuff that is otherwise would go to a waste pile um, and, tr and think about the messy reality of life. And I also liked the idea that um, I had friends giving me things, um, sort of necklaces and stuff. I kind of sort of had a call for that. And it's nice that I've got some fragments of their lives rescuing and um, elevating them and giving them a new life too. And I, I like this quote by Sally, your singer, some other, uh, uh, an artist. She says, we, like the silent objects, are on the threshold of perpetual crisis or redemption. So my scrap pile is um, anti-aesthetic. Anti -aesthetic. Hmm. Uh, in other words, um, I wasn't so interested in making something beautiful, certainly not with a scrap pile, um, but with the other part, which is a, a contrast, I guess, the fragile drawing in space, um, I, um, I wanted that to be, uh, you know, uh, sort of, as I just said, very fragile and um, playful and, I guess, allude to things like the Milky Way but, and, in, you know, stardust, but also things like webs and um, mycelium. Um, and I felt I wanted the piece to be poised between desolation and hope. So I'm going to move on to some other work now. Um, I'm taking you back in time, not too far back actually, um, just to um, 2017 when I was on my MA. I did an, an MA belatedly in my life and um, it set me on a new course. Um, my work changed quite, quite dramatically, I guess, uh, although it still has elements of my previous work in it. Um, and I created this piece in a room uh, called Matter and Flux and I wanted to show that to you first because it's, I, I think, quite related to the work in here, the dust of stars. Um, Matter of Flux was an expansive installation um, that was inspired by microscopic particles of spider webs. Um, so I um, literally studied these little tiny, tiny little bits of spider web and it, it felt like I was, I, I created this little film as well called Spider Web, web Safari because I literally was going through with the microscope tiny, tiny little um, you know, levels of, of difference between one bit and another and seeing complete, like, the universes of, of bits and particles and bits of legs, and it was incredible. Anyway, so um, that was a response to that. Um, and, yes, it's a big dream, um, weaving, sorry, it's a big drawing in space um, about line growth and energy, and that's a close-up of it. And um, as you can see, I've used all sorts of things, um, objects, um, you know, soft, hard, uh, fragile, not fragile, it, um, combined sort of strange things together, and I really enjoyed making it. I have to give a nod to um, Cornelia Parker. Um, this is her Cold Dark Matter um, in 1991, and she has inspired me, um, and I feel that it, I owe a lot to her. Um, and the fact that it relates to dark matter is quite appropriate for the piece I've made in here. Um, so it's quite an in I think it's quite interesting that observable matter is less than 5% of total matter in the universe. Um, the rest we is dark and we don't see it, but there is this stuff called um, dark matter, which is very linear and it all kind of weaves through it itself and it's, it's just everywhere in space and around us. Um, so um, later on during that, period I made um, instead of a cross, an albatross. Um, and this was created for, uh, as a, again, a site responsive piece in Walcott Chapel and Bath, and um, deeply disturbing images of dead albatross chicks uh, with bloated stomachs filled with plastic inspired that. Um, 
but also Coleridge's poem, so I'm kind of combining the two. Um, and I, it was a kind of altar piece, so there are sort of slightly carcass-like um, elements to it, um, with a, the middle of it sort of with all sorts of, of sprat material that includes plastic. And Glut, I made in 2018, um, was a response to factory farming particularly, but also plastic oceans. Um, it made a, a, a whole realm of, of recycled, found and discarded materials, um, including personal items such as um, my dog's lead. My dog died at the time and um, it, it was all quite an upsetting time for me, but um, also in the world, I was kind of reading a lot about what was going on. Um, I was reading a book called Planet of the Slums. I watched a film by Nicholas Gerholter at House and Worth called Our Daily Bread, which is a cold, hard look at, at um, factory farming. And all those things came together in this piece. So it's a kind of a wailing. Um, it's about really um, love, loss, um, death, vulnerability, but also renewal. So in, in amongst the sort of, I guess, the horror, um, there's a, a sort of a tenderness and a, and a sense of, of hope, um, you know, new beginnings perhaps. And my work is quite mel melancholic these days, I would say. Um, and I have a feeling that it, there, is, there is sort of deep-rooted grief uh, way back in my life that um, is coming out more and more. My mum died when I was two and um, my father died this year. So I guess things like that um, are kind of coming up, resurfacing a li little bit more as I get older and older. And that's another picture of um, image with glut, but also two other pieces in it. So um, I made Tongue uh, shortly after Glut, uh, it, well, about a, a year after actually, um, and I had this residency in some cells in um, Trowbridge Town, Town Hall, and I then, it, the <coughs> residency led to a solo exhibition called Offenders, and I, I was still on the track of factory farming and, um, you know, um, those, those sort of themes, so I... Um, the, the solo was called, I said, just said that, solo was called Offenders. Um, this piece called Tongue was all about, um, uh, I don't know, sort of, um, uh, you know, f a, a vulnerable, fleshy, bodily form, obviously a tongue, um, but it was sort of in one, uh, in one end kind of, it, it had been ripped out, so the other part of this has all sorts of outpourings of duvets and, and um, textiles and things. Um, and I guess it, it, there was this sort of vulnerable um, softness juxtaposed against the hardness of its prop, which, which was quite uh, precarious um, as a prop. So it's, a, it's an abject piece, not supposed to be beautiful, um, and, but it has, I guess, an alluring quality to it because it had wax over the top of it, which created a quite an interesting um, surface. Um, I also curate projects as well as um, make work for them. And in um, 2019, I co-curated a project called Bee Wing. And for that, I created these, a series of five quite large or very large um, ladder-like forms. Um, and this is one of them. And th um, they span three floors of the, the wing in Shepton Malik Prison. So it's a disused prison. Um, and I have since re- um, re, re, uh, re interpreted those ladders in different spaces like Wells Cathedral and um, and Walcott Chapel. There we go, on the right says Walcott Chapel. Um, but just going back to this one. Um, so this one, I feel, has a sort of skeletal structure which alludes to um, slight but also uh, extinct animals hung in museums so there was again this um, kind of suggestion that well it's a, it's about escape and it's about sort of dreams and hope but there's also this um, re reference to incarceration and the dysfunctional ladders um, are kind of also precarious and I was looking at um, an artist called Piranesi who created some etchings um, called the Imaginary Prison Series, which have been sort of uh, endless bridges and kind of ladder forms going up and around. Um, and my work 
or this piece was about that game slate, snakes and ladders, but also the endless cycle of um, greed, suffering, um, and but also perhaps um, uh, hope in the end. So Pyre um, was created just before lockdown 20, 2020, and just at that, um, just prior to the lock, to lockdown, we had um, some horrendous wildfires in the Amazon and Australia, um, and that just was so upsetting um, that I created this piece for um, for an actual exhibition um, called Incendiary, and it's a collection of treasured finds that I have collected over years, many, many years, objects and of, of all sorts, to, you know, pods and bits of wood and nails and insects and um, bird claws and all sorts of things. Um, and I, I charred them all and bound them together in very small little bundles, um, which I regarded as grief bundles. And the work was sort of almost like a, 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 a kind of, well, a pyre um, of rem remembrances. And in lockdown, I created this project called Life in the Undergrowth, which was all about the hidden worlds in my garden that get overlooked. So I created a whole series of works, um, sculptural pieces, drawings, um, and ended up with a film. But this is just one of the, the pieces called Entanglement, or oh, sorry, Entangled Six. Uh, I created a lot of different ones, and it was they were all quite playful, quite awkward, not kind of really thinking about um, you know, <coughs> showing them in an exhibition or anything, um, or using things from my garden um, that I dug up, actually quite a lot of them while I was digging up as I was sort of sowing seeds and doing the things that we, a lot of us were doing at that time. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's um, an interesting, odd piece. And so, just at the end of lockdown, um, I was still in that mode of using kind of wood and things that I'd found in my garden, and I created this piece called The Fall. Um, I was in the woods and I, I saw this overturned tree with some amazing roots sort of falling out of it, cascading out of it. Uh, it, it seemed very sad um, as a thing, and, but also very interesting to draw, and that it led to this piece. Um, and I was quite interested, the fact that um, it was at a time, it was at, in autumn when I was drawing it. Um, there were a lot of autumnal leaves around. I collected some really gorgeous tulip leaves, um, which, so, uh, but I'm also playing on the idea. So I've also got some feathers in it um, and the feathers have been charred um, and waxed. And I kind of um, talking about Icarus as well, the, the story of Icarus and how he flew too close to the, the sun. Um, to his detriment, and it's a bit like our our species, really. Mm. Oh, and yeah, so actually, um, connected to the previous uh, piece, but also to this piece, there's this phrase in a book that I've been reading that I read called The Overstory by Richard Powers, and this phrase, um, I really love it, it's, um, there are no separable events, the bird and branch are linked creatures. So hope of a tree, um, is um, a piece that travelled around the southwest of England along with other artworks um, as part of a project called Inch by Inch. And it was, um, uh, they, so they went to community spaces in the southwest, um, but the, the brief, well, we gave ourselves a brief to create artworks in cases. So I chose to make mine in a big old trunk an antique trunk, and I made these pieces that um, uh, retracted and expand and came out. So I erected the piece every time I, I took it to a place, opened the trunk uh, lid, and stood it on its end. And and these uh, I erected these pieces that were kind of umbrella forms, but also tree-like forms. And I had uh, completely reappropriated the umbrellas and added the my own um, fabric, which was all yellow. And that's all about hope. So to me, yellow is a colour of hope. Um, so, yeah, it's all hand-stitched and recycled textile. And that's at Free Museum. So, last year, um, I created a piece called Martyrdom of the Ten Thousand. And it was for Chichester Cathedral. 
and that's it there's um, and it was for a project called Together We Rise um, and I had been wanting to do a piece or make a piece about the plight of pangolins because I've got this deep sort of love of pangolins I don't know if I hope you all know what a pangolin is but if you don't I'm going to tell you it's this lovely little scaly creature that's very quiet it's very shy it lives in Africa and Asia there's different species different types um, and some of them are quite large and some are less large and they're sort of a, I don't know I suppose a small dog size but um, they curl up in a ball when they're in threatened and so they're very easy to pick up and pop into a plastic bag and and ship over to Asia to um, to rip off their scales, um, which is used for keratin, and their meat is also for um, a delicacy, meat delicacy. But anyway, I so I created this piece called Martyrdom of the Ten Thousand um, about that slaughtering of the thousands of pangolins, and um, these are sort of skeletal structures that are poised between completion and incompletion. Um, and so they're in varying stages of translucency and decay. Um, it was at a time we'd just gone through COVID, and COVID, of course, came from the wet, wildlife wet markets, which all had a connection with pangolins because they were blamed for the actual beginning of COVID, but actually it was our unethical human practices that led to that. Um, but the uh, title of several paintings in the Renaissance by Dura, um, sorry, he, um, Dura painted a lot of, uh, paintings in the a few paintings in the Rena Renaissance called Martyrdom of the Ten Thousand, and I'm alluding to those paintings where Christians were um, slaughtered by by Romans, Roman soldiers. Um, but here I'm I'm sort of um, twisting it slightly and and trying to raise awareness about mitre species um, <coughs> justice. And they're all recycled materials, tie dyed, um, homemade plant inks I've used, um, and. Sti hand stitched and waxed over um, uh, woven structures of, of mainly um, mattress springs. So this year, um, I was very lucky to get a d developing your creative practice award from the Arts Council. So I was given that gave me a bit of time to, to make um, new work, but also make it in in bigger spaces. And I uh, so I made this piece above and below at a place called Create in Shepton Mallet and had a residency there and um, I collected materials. I had been to Kenya, Kenya on a research trip as part of my uh, developing your creative practice because it's where I come from originally uh, or where I was brought up anyway and um, that um, informed this piece a lot because I, I had a lot of pieces I brought, the things I brought back from there, um, all sorts, you know, um, I don't know, sisal, um, bits of stuff from the beach and bits of palm tree, um, uh, a little, uh, all sorts of uh, insect, shouldn't have really, but I did. Um, so, and it's about the entanglements of matter, um, rhizomic systems and debris and the strata that we walk on. And this was exhibited at, um, in Tremonia Sculpture Gardens this year, um, along with this next piece. Um, so this piece is called Flags of the Forest. And I created it firstly as an indoor piece um, over a period of about nine months, um, all hand stitched, hand dyed. Um, it's got fabric, but it's also got plastic. Um, and I suspended it indoors uh, to start with, um, but then built on it as an outdoor piece for Tremonier Sculpture Gardens. And um, Seamus here was in the show, same show. It was with the Royal Society of Sculptors. So this is. Um, layered patchworks of hand-stitched um, fabric and plastic and all sorts. So it's like fields of colour um, which are kind of activated by the elements. So the idea is that outdoors um, uh, the elements will, you know, add to the work and they certainly did because it was a very stormy summer. Um, so the flags were really put... Um, given that given their jobs worth and i also created this um this small water feature that reflected the flags um and all the uprights are recycled and found bits of wood and metal which are, are kind of put together and they're kind of like drawings in space i guess so this piece i guess is in it's waiting now for its um 
its next in incarnation. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm going to probably rework it, add to it, um, and, and hoping to find the next venue. And that's that. Uh, is uh, this is in Tremonier Filter Garden, in, in uh, Cornwall, in Penzant. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if anybody's got any questions, do you ask. Yeah. I've got a question for you there. Uh, what are you going to be working on next? Oh gosh, Jan. <laughs> I wonder. Um, well. Um, I've got, I've got a sort of a, a seed of an idea of a sort of series that um, I want to make. Um, and of course, you and I are going to be curating a show next year in the zigzag, which is um, Chris Black's um, wonderful space in Glastonbury. Um, so hoping that what I make in this seed of an idea will be part of that. But I want to make quite a lot of these pieces. I, I don't want to say too much because I'm not, it, the, the, the work isn't that um, developed yet. Uh, precarious pieces, but um, I guess there's going to be a, a connection with Above and Below, that piece that's, um, that's, that, that's uh, that one. Yes. Uh, a little bit, but not really. Um, and um, I want to make little ones. I want to make quite a lot of small pieces as well as the all tall, because yes. the tall and the big is quite a an effort to yeah. uh, transport and store and everything. Yeah. yeah. So, is that? Okay. I'd like to ask you a question, Sienna. Um, when, what would you most like people to take away from your piece here? In, when they see it, what is, because there's so much in there. The mm. story of matter ongoing, the recycling, the, what we value, what we discard. Mm. If there was one, uh, one aspect of that piece you'd like people to take away. a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I would quite like people to feel that all material has a value, um, <laughs> that um, nothing is, 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 is sort of is rubbish. I know that I know we have to throw things away. Obviously, yeah. we have to, but just a bit more kind of valuing things. Just mm. you know, mm. odd old things that you know everything has a charm and a value, and and maybe being a bit more imaginative about how that that might be able to be used. I think that would that would be a good thing. Really, that's what we. Can I just just one little thing? I'm just thinking, because I've been sat here, look, I, mean, I think I've got a wonderful view, because I can hear you talking, and I can see that there. But when you were saying earlier about things being anti-aesthetic, mm. I wonder if that gives you a kind of freedom. But also, I'd like to say, is actually looking at that, I think it's aesthetically <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I, I guess I meant more the scrap pile. Um, yeah. Oh, of course. Yes. Oh, yes. So oh, that was actually the course. first that part is, of yeah. that piece. Yeah. In fact, the the other yeah. part was the the second thought. Of it course, wasn't the yeah. first thought. Yeah. So the scrap pile was the first thought. Then I felt it needed something else, and so I was oh, I worked what? through that. Oh, that and right? well, then that's why I've got um, these two. So mm. on the right, I didn't really explain, but on the right is the scrap pile, the mad thing. Um, oh, but yeah. then the delicate thing kind of near it does a contrast as a sort oh, of, yeah. you know, the two working mm -hmm. against or that with each other. Yeah, yeah when we were talking earlier about it and I said to you about the, the nebula kind of feel to the floaty bit, but it also has a kind of a feeling of the, the spirit of the, the scrap pile leaving and going somewhere else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. Like, like that piece at the end of all the people dying every 72 seconds and the amount of rubbish we generate goes on to be from something else yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. But uh, the, the more you look at it, the more you can see where you're coming from. Yeah. I suppose there are quite a lot of things that I was thinking. It's quite hard to, you know, it's hard to verbalise, isn't it? You're very yeah. good at verbalising. But um, I guess also one of the things in my head was 
it sounds a bit literal, but I kind of thought the scrap pile is sort of our planet, and the the dust, the, the little study that is the is what's around in space. You know, there's so much more. There's that magic, isn't there, yeah. hovering. Yeah.